are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. Our featured spirit of the week is Pine Top Distillery of Raleigh inside the Beltline. We're a team of self-taught distillers using our shared backgrounds in engineering, biochemistry, finance, and marketing to bring Raleigh its first true grain-to-glass distillery, producing unaged bourbon-style moonshine and citrus-induced gin. Check them out online at pinetopdistillery.com and on social at Pine Top Distillery. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast with our fancy new intro. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today, not only do we have a new intro song, but we are timely with this breaking news. Well, that's SportsCenter. But uh, it's breaking news nonetheless. Uh, And we have to talk about Senate Bill 290 and House Bill 971 and all these other issues regarding the possible privatization of liquor and other things related to that or germane to that as a word I just learned. We have Ms. Margot Metzger, the Director of Communications for the NCRLA in studio. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being (laughs) here. That's quite an intro there, Matt. I know we want to get right into it. We want to get we want to talk about liquor. We want to talk about North Carolina uh, and how it affects everything. And Matt wanted to be really serious off the top, so which is why I have to throw a wrench in the whole thing. Margo, my team beat you the scavenger hunt, the curate scavenger hunt, Oof, low just two months ago. It right in. Wow. Right, and right that now, is just a yep. sick burn right off the bat, man. Minutes before you walked in, Bringing my butler Keely was uh, putting together a whole list of all the fun like Things gift you're certificates do and in rooms Nashville. that we're going to stay in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you and Nation and Matt Fern and uh, Sean Wilson did not win. You came in second place. That was that was a tough loss. You guys were pretty strong team. (laughs) It was controversial, I know. (laughs) (laughs) There, there were some words, Uh, but anyhow, welcome to the studio. Thank you for being here because not only are you a professional scavenger hunter, but yeah, you work with the NCRLA. We've had Alyssa Barkley on the show previously. NCRLA stands for North Carolina North Carolina Restaurant and lodging association so your purpose well why don't you tell me what is the purpose of north carolina's restaurant and lodging association so ncrla is an association of hotels and restaurants and sort of everything else that falls under food service and lodging uh it's a an association where we join forces to represent the interests of those people. Yeah. Sort of like the Craft Brewers Guild represents brewers, and the Distillers Association represents distillers. We represent hotels and restaurants. Essentially, your business is to facilitate the business of hospitality in North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, So shall we jump right into it, I think? Yeah. What just happened last week? Well, uh, it felt like moving a mountain. Yeah. But we, along with a, a coalition of other groups, passed a pretty amazing package of reforms, yeah. which was um, also known as Senate Bill 290. Um, it became a mashup of several alcohol reform bills that we had been working for the past year. And it all came together, and we passed the bill, and now... You know, the the industry is just super excited about the changes that are being made and already saying, what's next? <laughs> so let's just outline those. So what 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 are we allowed to do now? So uh, from the perspective of restaurateurs and bars and hotels that have either a restaurant or a bar, there are some key things that will help get them out of the dark ages. Right. It, at least the way it relates to um, liquor. So now, I'm not sure how many people know this. A lot of people probably in the industry that listen to this podcast. But, you know, forever, restaurants and bars have had beer and wine delivered to their Mm -hmm. restaurant. But they've never been able to get a liquor order delivered. Right. They actually have to go to the liquor store, uh, send the manager with their personal vehicle. (laughs) With a certified check. With a certified check. 
then like go to the back door of the ABC store, put it in the trunk of their car, and haul like a couple thousand dollars worth of liquor back to the to yeah. the place. Right. Uh, so now they'll be able to get it delivered. That is a big deal for a lot of folks in the will industry. Will that be privatized, or will that be run through a? Uh, the state. So the the law allows for both of those things to happen. Okay. So either the ABC board can run its own delivery if it feels like it has the capacity to do it, but independent contractors are also allowed. But either, you will pay a premium. The re, the restaurant or the the sh, the yeah the restaurant or the bar will pay well, a premium for that. It remains to be seen. It does allow for a delivery fee from okay. the let's ABC into, board. Well, let's get into the little points more specifically. But just here at the top, yeah. let's just list like the big yeah. stuff that happened. So okay. So, so that one. Yeah. Um, we also have like single bottle yeah, special orders now. Single bottle is, special orders. That's another thing, just as a person that's placed many orders through the ABC as a front of the house manager. If you wanted Herb Saint uh, absinthe, let's say, which is already it's like 70 bucks wholesale, you would have to buy 12 bottles of that to bring in. And no one would, well, no one would do that because you don't need 12 bottles of absinthe. You just want one really good bottle of that. And so thus we just as a community wouldn't buy those things because it's not economically feasible. And so then basically that makes our uh, selections a lot smaller due to economic restrictions. So now we can order special order anything single bottle. That's right. Which is amazing. Yeah. And when we surveyed the members of the Restaurant and Lodging Association and said, you know, what are your top pro- what are your top priorities? What do you want us to be working on on your behalf to make change? That was one of the things that was at the top of the list yeah. was this uh, flexibility to be able to just order one bottle. And by the way, this also is for consumers. Sure. So right. whether so, it's yeah. me going to the liquor store and I want something special just personally or as a restaurateur or bar owner, I want something for my shelf, then I have the option to just get one. And I do think you're right that this is really going to open up um, – the possibilities for for bar owners who either because they just couldn't put that much cash in to do a whole case of something special yeah. or they didn't even have anywhere to put it um, back stock wise. Right. Now they'll be able to be more creative and, um, you know, give us the cocktails that we deserve. <laughs> right? Can I, right. Can I also just uh, play put a wrench in that hole or uh, put a put a fly in the ointment first thing? Because essentially if we eventually do move to private privatization of liquor, that part of the bill will be null and void because it won't matter. Um, well, that, yeah, nearly everything, everything in here, well, nearly everything in the bill would be null and void if, if the pri- system a true were privatization because what happened. you would then have is uh, a free market right system mm-hmm. mostly. Yeah, I mean, there's an asterisk on that because of the three tier system. That sure. is standard here. Yeah. Um, but before, I, you know, let me also say that back to the Dark Ages piece. Yeah. We did mention the certified check. Now every ABC board will be required to take electronic payment from a mixed beverage customer. Okay. So the, the days of either cash, certified check, t- correct to the penny are going away. Yeah. Now you can pay with a credit card currently. Uh, well, you can because I just did like three days ago with a credit card, and and so you can swipe a card for uh, for hotel. I mean, for for restaurant tours, you put your order in online. You don't you can't pay online, but you put your order digitally through, and then the next day you get an email saying, okay, your order will be ready after noon. You can come pick it up then. So then you can show up, but you have to have a credit card, and that credit card has to can't be a random one. It has to be the one tied to the account, right? And and you swipe it. The problem there though is, you know, the owner is the owner of the credit card. But the person going to buy the, the product, physically pick it up, is me or my butler, Keeley, or uh, the bar manager or whatever. So then that person has to be trusted to take that credit card and physically bring it to the place, which is just kind of a silly yeah. uh, extra step. So now we don't have to do that because it's purchased online through, you know, the owner can mm-hmm. buy it or the manager can buy it. And anyone that's representative of that business can go pick it up or have it delivered to you. Yeah. And, you know, you may feel like, You've got it hard here in Wake County, but Wake County is one of the most efficient, um, modernized ABC boards Mm -hmm. in spite of the whole, like, lottery system we saw in Wendell a few weeks ago when they were trying to, you know, find a way to allocate special products. Some of that stuff still feels very dark ages, but 
Most ABC boards, by the way, there are 170 mm-hmm. in our state. Mm-hmm. Most of them do not take any electronic payment. So okay, yeah. just so because just they be do it in Wake thing. doesn't mean they do it. Yeah. In, I think they might do it in Mech. Okay. Let's get back to the bullet pointing out of what, yeah. what has changed and what we are now allowed to do. So L- delivery, electronic payment, single bottle orders, but then allow distilleries to sell beer and wine. And, of course, not to this bill, but what just recently happened separately, but in the same timely fashion, is that distilleries can now sell their products at – in directly a, a, to direct, consumer. They can, they can make cocktails at their yep. oh, yeah. distillery. Same bill, actually. It was all the same. It's okay. all in there together. It all got mashed in there together. So, yeah, this is huge for distilleries. That's awesome. And having worked so closely with brewers and wineries over the years, um, I have often looked at the North Carolina distillery industry and thought to myself, if we would just take the handcuffs off, they will do great things. Yep. They will thrive. They will become the next wave of, you know, tourism, beverage-related tourism that we have in North Carolina. And this bill is the thing that's going to give them um, that ability because the on-site sales are so critical when you're a small startup. That's been so true for the brewers that I've worked with. And, um, yeah, to be able to just make a drink with your own spirits. Wow. You know, you would think the sky was falling. Um, well, and isn't it cool? Like friends of ours, shout out to uh, Durham Distillery because they just announced that hmm, they might have known that this was going into the works yeah. because just a day after the bill passed, they opened Corpse Reviver, which is their bar yep. that's connected to the distillery in Durham. And of course, they make the delicious Conniption American Dry and Navy Strength Gin, and they have all their canned cocktails that just came out. Not a sponsor of this podcast, just. This podcaster enjoys drinking their stuff, so uh, good shout out to them. But but that's cool. So that even like like Lassiter's, uh, you know, Gentry's yeah. now slinging drinks at, at at Lassiter's Distillery. Topo can make drinks there. You can go to you know whomever. Pine wants Top, to do it. who's the this week's sponsor, that's you can right. get a drink there. Pine Top, the uh, from grain to glass to cocktail to your belly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it also removes the five bottle restriction, which I'm so happy that happened. Yeah, that's huge yeah. because if you've got someone who's a regular visitor to North Carolina and they might want to, you know, carry home gifts for their family and friends, that five bottle max was really limiting. Yeah. And that was five bottles per year per person. Yeah. So I'm if you know that was only that only existed for a year. Prior to that it was one bottle. <laughs> that's right. For for years. It was you could buy one bottle from somebody and that's unfortunate. So like the aforementioned Topo has know, like seven bottles in yeah. their lineup. Right. So any person couldn't just buy their entire portfolio, which is foolish. You know, it's like, well, what the heck? We're not trying to start a lemonade stand on the corner selling liquor. We just want to buy the stuff for our own personal use. And the fact that you had to be limited to five bottles in a year just seems so archaic. And well, I understand. Take that one step further. Not only are you limited five bottles per year from there, but then the ABC board can decide not to carry it, whatever. So if you're in a certain county, you can't even get that product so you can literally can only have one bottle a year because at yeah. least with other products okay you can only buy five directly from the distillery but, but then you might be able to buy more from the abc boards but the abc might not have it yeah right. so. and on that point so uh we at ncrla worked really closely with the distillers association of north carolina on this bill and you know we it's frustrating for a distiller when they want to sell a product to a restaurant and they can't get the order filled yeah. It's frustrating sure. on the restaurant side. They want to support a local distiller and feature that, yep. but they can't get it. And so now this new law, this is also part of SB 290, if a restaurant orders um, a product from a local distiller and the ABC, um, the ABC board can't fulfill the order through the normal channel all the way through the Raleigh warehouse in 48 hours, then the restaurant... Um, there's sort of a workaround wherein the ABC board, they can't buy direct, but the ABC board can buy direct from the distiller instead of having to send the product all the way to Raleigh and back again for a lot of these far flung distilleries. Cause you know, the state only has the one warehouse right? and everything must pass through it. Well, that's no longer true. Oh, so that's huge. It is. I was going to say, cause special orders still put us back a few weeks before we can get it. So now we're saying that the, 
So like, here well, not in Raleigh, special orders, but orders from a North Carolina lo- from a North Carolina distillery, which could possibly be a special order, right? Well, like, Lasseter Distilling, their Rum Al Cafe was something that I think was not going to make the cut after mm-hmm. the, the the last um, law came down, you know, about needing to be five thousand dollars of profit per year yeah. and and whatever. So the only way you could get Rum Al Cafe would be to order twelve bottles on a special order, and then that process would take two to three weeks just to even get into the warehouse and then you get the order. So, I mean, yeah. who we're in the restaurant industry, folks. We're not that organized. There's no way we would have the forethought of like three weeks in advance to place an order to mm-hmm. get something. So now it's like, oh, we just ran out. Quick, make an order. Can we get it tomorrow? So it might not be tomorrow, but it possi- possibly be a couple days rather than a couple weeks, yeah. which is really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just promoting so much business. So whether or not it becomes privatized or not. This system currently, the way the law has changed, has really made it so much more uh, flexible for a restaurateur, a bar, uh, and for the distilleries, which then I think also is going to promote more people wanting to make distilled you know, uh, spirits and all and basically improve the craft because I, I would think that with the, with the exception of the few that are already doing it, many people are discouraged to even make liquor in North Carolina because of all the loopholes you'd have to run through just to make a profit. So now it's kind of it's a fair game. It's a game. <laughs> it is absolutely a game changer. No question about it. Yeah. You know, having worked with the Brewers Guild, um, those North Carolina brewers who had much friendlier uh, laws in place to right. allow them to sell their own stuff on site and self-distribute their own product, have 10% of the market share. And distillers... Have 10% of all beer market yeah, share, Yeah, in North okay. Carolina, which is pretty significant. significant. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, the distillers have, I think, less than one half of 1% mm. right now. So this will enable them... You know, it's not that people are going to drink more... No. People are going to make a choice to support a local distillery because it will be available to them. It will be an option. Yeah. And um, to me, that's really the one of the big wins here and is then, to keep that local money in the local economy. On, well, and to keep it local, if you want to buy beer or wine, you have four locations of Triangle Wine Company, sponsor of our podcast, that uh, provides you with whatever you like. And they've been doing delivery since the beginning, everybody. This is not, we didn't need SB 290 to pass to get your beer and wine delivered because uh, Triangle Wine Company's been doing it for a while. You go to trianglewineco.com to get your beer and wine. You put in the NCFB promo code and you get a little gift from us, basically. A little, little money back in your pocket uh, so that you can go buy some liquor somewhere else. Visit uh, trianglewineco.com or visit them at any of their four locations. Where are those places again, Matt? I forget. <laughs> They're in Southern Pines, Holly Springs, woohoo, Morrisville, and Cary. There are so many parts to this bill, and we're not going to go through every single one because some are just so specific and tedious, but there are 26 parts to this bill. The big ones we already kind of mentioned. The one that we didn't really talk about, uh, we haven't gotten to yet, is like, Farmers markets. You can now do malt beverage tastings at farmers markets. That's great. Like basically, you can do a beer tasting at a farmers market. Yeah, that's cool. Why not? Beer is food, right? We've discussed that on a previous show. Mm-hmm. So why not be able to try that? But the one that really is amazing. Uh, everybody, uh, seventy-five years and older, listen up. Alcohol at bingo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can drink at bingo places. Allow sale and consumption of alcohol at bingo games. There you go, Grandma. <laughs> so- Drink it up. <laughs> that's the one part that that's you want. That's the big one. Yeah, that's that's the what we're going to lead with. They're going to edit game this to be the front. Game changer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, ba- uh, but places where you can drink, because now they're allowing, is it tra- on trains and ferries to sell Actually, alcohol? Actually, that liquor, got or cut. Or that got cut. Okay. Yeah. This bill, or, so this was originally three different bills. Right. And they all went through the ringer individually, um, and some stuff didn't make it okay like sunday sales okay in so that abc didn't stores it. didn't make it and what about sales on ferries didn't make it but abc store tastings did make it but which with, is so silly why it wasn't yeah. happening well um you know the this system that we have in place that is our abc liquor control system harkens back to you know the 1930s prohibition. and yeah. prohibition and so it's it's changed very little since then um, the reality is that it just took someone making the effort. 
somebody had to say, I'm going to make this somebody's full-time job to go forth and try to make this change. Is that Chuck McGrady? Well, that's you. Uh, <laughs> it's absolutely Chuck McGrady, yeah, but I mean, also, Senator been, Chuck McGrady. yeah. Well, Representative State Chuck Senator. McGrady and Senator Senator. Senator Rick Gunn were the two lawmakers who really have tried over the past few sessions to make change here. Yeah. But it is a team effort, and it takes a lot of work from stakeholders, and that's where groups like the Restaurant and Lodging Association come in and do what is quite expensive work sure. to try to explain the merits of why all these things need to happen, that they're good for business, that they're good for the economy, that they're not going to create a public safety issue, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, w- but, but tastings, you know, in a liquor store, yeah, to us, it doesn't seem like a big deal. Um, to some folks in older generations, it is a big deal. So there are very tight restrictions on, you know, when you can do them and who can do them. And those are the kind of things that get added on to the end. But it's still a big step. So I, I just want to put out something because, I, you know, in my in my day job, I'm doing in-store tastings all the time. Yeah. And it's funny to me because often people will have the reaction of like, oh, just a little bit. Well, I'm just pouring you a little bit. It's less than an, a half an ounce of wine that I'm pouring right. you. You're, I'm not here to get you drunk. I'm here to have you to taste this product yeah. and appreciate it, what it's like. And I think there's a philosophical uh, divide there with things that these starting new progressive bills or laws are coming into place of like places you can drink and where available where alcohol is available to you. I don't think that, and I'm I'm pretty sure there are studies to back this up. That sounds like an idiotic statement. There are studies to back this up that I've heard things that that just because alcohol is more available does not mean that people are going to be drinking more or that right. we are going to have more alcohol related incidents. It just means that it's available because you can still have as much alcohol as you want. You just got to do it in the privacy of your own home versus right. the other places. Right. It's an inconsistent statistic that privatized and state run liquor have higher or lower Alcoholic, alcoholic consumption. Yeah. It's, it's irrelevant, basically. It's yes. Just, like, basically, you know, you might just be in a state that everyone drinks a lot or not, but it's not based on uh, the state controlling it or not. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How, what was NCRLA's, like, specific role and yours, Margot? Like, how did you really get this ball rolling and what, what were you doing? Like, how did we formulate enough momentum to get there? Um, yeah, it was like a slow roll of thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and it started, um, you know over a year ago probably in the spring when I first um you know I've worked on wine policy I've worked on beer policy and um having talked to the CEO of the North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association she was ready to start addressing her members concerns about um liquor so she and I teamed up to try to figure out how we we're going to do this. You're speaking of Lynn. Yeah, Lynn Minges, Lynn Minges yeah. the the CEO. Um, you know, she hears a lot from restaurants and hotels that this is a big problem. I mean, if you talk to restaurant owners, this is what they sit around and bitch about sure. when they're having drinks together. Oh, yeah. This uh, is, or on the podcast. <laughs> right? It is a major problem. And so, you know, we said, all right, it's time to see what we can do here. So, you know, we started having – conversations with Representative McGrady, who I work very closely with um, on Brewers issues, and as well as Senator Rick Gunn, who's been a huge proponent for the distillers. And then we start building this coalition with the Retail Merchants Association. Mm -hmm. We start building a coalition that includes the Distillers Association in North Carolina. We talk to DISCUS, the Distilled Spirits Council for the U.S., and we start all coming up with what are our pieces you know what are the Mm -hmm. things we want to address for the different stakeholders that we represent and you know the bill sponsors would say all right tell us tell us where the pain points are let's see what we can do to alleviate some of that Um, so it's a really long process this bill took over a year to come together and it was the product of three different bills um but so, you say over a year. I mean, I feel like there's been initiative to privatize li- liquor on the main scale for years and years. Yeah, you know? it's never really gotten any legs. Okay, um, this was the first time meaning that, like that it's actually gone 
through stages. But yeah. let's be let's be clear here. This is not about privatizing liquor. This yeah. is about relaxing some of the laws that are inside of the state run uh, parameters, which is which is fine. Like, well, some of the things that are happening right now are making it to where, you know, I'm sure the state doesn't want to completely go privatize. But they're like, how can we meet in the middle to where we satisfy our customers, both business to business and business to client or customer, and still generate the revenue that we'd like without, you know, bringing in? Because there's also a good argument for state run policy and and liquor in that once like we are protected as North Carolina by the state. So that we don't get like the Wild West in many other states. Like I'm from California and the liquor program out there is wild and, and somewhat, you know, more open. But it also leads to small business getting crushed by the bigger businesses because there isn't as much protection. So I rep I work for Southern Wine and Spirits, the largest distributor in the nation. And we would just gobble up and and take over small distributors trying to get out there once they just, we call them ankle biters. Once these ankle biters would come in and have a cool product, we were like, uh, let's just go take their product from out of their book and then basically cripple them. And then those distributors would go away. And that's not cool either. That's like Starbucks moving in right next door to a, a family run uh, coffee shop. So there is protection here. And, you know, Matt, you've worked for big distributors like for a long time. And if this became completely privatized, oh, don't think that we wouldn't just be completely inundated with huge, big national, you know, national brands and corporate spending, which would also lead to more, you know, Olive Gardens and P.F. Chang's and, and big box stores all around the place. So be careful. There mm -hmm. is a there's yes. a slippery slope between all of that. What makes North Carolina's food, pro, food and beverage culture so great has partly to do with us being a state run control state in whatever I'm saying. But we do need to get we need to update some of these outdated laws, and that's what this bill, SB, um, you know, SB two hundred and ninety, helped kind of clear up. Yeah, I would call this. So we made it very clear, at least from the perspective of NCRLA and the retail merchants NCRMA, that we believe that the real problems that are associated with the liquor control system and how it relates to. Um, you know, choice and all the, all the things that, you know, need to be fixed will really only be fixed when we find a better model than the full control model that mm -hmm. we have right now. Mm -hmm. We made that very clear in the beginning of the session. So SB so 290, as big as it seems and as earth, as, as hard as it was to move it um, and get it done, we still call this baby steps. Yeah. There is a lot of work left to do. And I think that people need to keep an open mind about what model f going forward is the right one for North Carolina as yes. it relates to liquor control. Because the one we have right now is inefficient and really wasteful, and it limits consumer choice in a big way. Mm -hmm. Now, the point, some of the points you made, I agree with you. I've seen that happen in other states where it's a referendum and that referendum is paid for by a major big box retailer. And so they shape the law mm -hmm. and they shape the ballot to the way they them. want to so that they are the winners in the end. And a lot of the mom and pops end up going out of business. And that's certainly not what we want or what we would advocate for. Um, so it's I think there's still a lot of information we need to gather to okay. try to figure out what's going to come next. But this week, you, you, you mentioned that in the past, this idea of privatization, mm -hmm. which we call licensure, it's just we just want spirits to be treated just like beer and wine. Yeah. That's a licensure model. So, so, just, so that, that's, that's your that's position clearly. There. That's been out there over the years back in the Purdue administration, the Easley administration. McCrory talked about it, but it never – Never, ever has a bill been filed before to actually show hmm. how you would do it if you did it. Okay. And that happened this week. Okay. So we What's, will now is have that House Bill 971. House Bill 971. Okay. Yeah. Um, and hopefully there'll be a fiscal memo to go with it that everybody can review and actually see, okay, let's, let's look at this objectively mm -hmm. and say, is there a better way? than the way we're doing it now. So if I'm if I'm reading that right, what I read in the bill a little bit was that if um, if if we were to give license 1000 permits to sell uh, spiritus or fortified liquor, that uh, the fiscal model was that was going to increase revenue by 20 percent statewide. 
Is it is that correct? Um, I don't think there's any fiscal memo that's been public. Okay. I think it said it would increase um, sales by by twenty twenty percent. Okay. Which you've got to keep in mind. Like I don't actually think that means that twenty people are going to drink twenty uh, percent more. You know, people have different preferences based on what's available to them, and it is a spectrum. Of, I mean, I don't know about you, but I enjoy beer, I enjoy wine, mm-hmm. I enjoy spirits, and that kind of ebbs and flows. You know, like what makes up that percentage? We don't we don't drink. <laughs> well, yeah. But simply put, like if you have if you have private privatized companies vying for the market share, they're going to have salespeople, they're going to have marketing material, they're going to give you know. Uh, pricing adjustments they're going to do a lot no offense to the gents that work over at the abc stores but it's not like they're coming around going good to see you max Trujillo. how can i help you out and would you like to try this would you like to it's usually yeah. what's up dude and then you just get what you want so i'm saying there do will be you do you get what you want because usually they don't have what i want <laughs> <laughs> no i mean <laughs> well, so that i mean no yeah. i think that's a good point and and, and the 20 percent is not necessarily a volume driven it might be premiumization of higher spiritus liquors that you're spending more money on that right. are available to you and let's also consider that we are right next to south carolina right which has a totally different model of, you know, liquor control. Right. And so a lot of folks in southern border counties buy their spirits across the oh, state yeah. line. Um, so some of that bump uh, is, is likely sales due will come to back in state. other folks yeah, who that's have been a great going point out of too. state. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. So, uh, okay, so 20% increase of sales. What is the what is the counter argument for the control board? Because they're going to be losing out on a lot of money then uh, from well, the taxes on still it. Getting or... the taxes on everything. Yeah, so yeah but they're getting taxed two ways. So right trust now, me, right? trust me that I've been in state government and politics long enough to know that if you're going to make a change this significant to a system that is very ingrained, sure, you better solve the money problem. Right. <laughs> yeah. And there are a lot of groups that depend on this money. <clears throat> mostly it's the state government general fund, but then a lot of other local governments also depend on revenues from this. So, so we're not suggesting that, that you uh, just do away with all that. There's a way to make it work so that nearly everyone gets the same amount or more revenue than they were already getting. Is um, that at a cost of the consumer? That remains to be seen. I think it's um, probably likely having researched other models – that your um, that some spirits, those that are lower priced, might go up a dollar or mm-hmm. two, but that the the higher end products would actually go down in price because the this bill HB nine seventy one is based on um, a gallonage tax, just like we tax beer and wine or a volume tax. Okay. Right now, the way we do it yeah. now, it's a for liquor, it's a 30% charge on the wholesale price of the bottle. So it's taxed not based on the sin, but how, like the quality of the sin, which is weird. <laughs> right. So Angel's Envy is the, has a higher taxed market than, say, like a, an Evan Williams bonded. Or in, Old Crow. Or Old Crow, yeah. Yeah, like, if you want to go way down on the shelf. <laughs> Wait, I'm yeah. not following. Why is that? Because it's a percentage of the value of the bottle rather than just the bottle. Oh, right. right. So, so gotcha, what gotcha. they're right saying now, is it's, it's more about ounces it's it's about fluid ounces taxed on the size of the bottle like, gotcha which like, is really a that's the way an excise tax should work mm-hmm. right because liquor is it's still say 40 percent alcohol in that bottle whether it's good alcohol or bad alcohol that's subjective so right. if somebody wants to charge a hundred dollars a bottle for a bottle of bourbon the state shouldn't get more money because it's just more expensive as a unit precisely they should just get it but but it does the state gets their money, though, on the low end, and they're smart because they know that more people are buying the low end than they are buying the high end. So they're actually going to generate more revenue. That's what I would have said if I was a lobbyist that day. I go, you all know we're, buy, we're buying cases of cheap booze, and we're buying bottles of the good stuff. So if we do this law, you're going to win, state, because you're going to get more taxes on, on, on fluid ounces than you will on bottles being moved. Well, hold on. Right. Is that, that 30% that's a markup on the sale, or that's only a markup on the taxes? Well, there are because it's, cause a, laundry, the state it's is, a laundry list of markups. Okay. If you look, because the state is the, the distributor as well, the so state they're actually is, buying the product. Yeah, and just to break it, just to go back to basics for a second. Yeah. So in North Carolina, we are a full control state. So that means the state is both the wholesaler and the retailer yep. 
of the product. It is also the regulator mm -hmm. um, of the product. That's a pretty difficult position to be in where you're trying to maximize revenue to the state while also telling people they shouldn't be drinking by, mm. you know, heavily, yeah. heavily taxing <laughs> the product. I mean, it's kind of a, those to me should be mutually exclusive. Right. So it'd be better to let retailers and restaurants do the business of selling mm -hmm. and allow the state to be in the business of permitting and regulating. So the bill uh, still keeps the ABC and the ALE in place. It still keeps all the monies there for um, substance abuse programs, et cetera. And it just lets the, the retailers, who've already proven that they can responsibly sell beer and wine, to do the same for spirits. It's a personal fantasy of mine to go in a beverage shop and have someone talk to me right. about the flavor profile of the scotch that I want to buy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Just like you do with wine and right? beer. Right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a fantasy, but I am really going to try to make that a reality because I, um, I just don't believe that because we've done it this way for 80 years that that's the best way to do it. And I do think that because of the hard work of Chuck McGrady um, and a lot of the other folks who are stakeholders, that we are going to bring to light a model that, you know, with some time, people can come around and get used to and say, huh, it's going to be a challenge. We've got to untangle all of it yeah. because of our system is very unique. No other state has local control. That's just North Carolina. We yeah. are a true anomaly. Because, like, in Virginia, for example, you have to sell to the state and then you're done, right? Then it's dispersed. Versus here, you get it into the state, then you have to sell to each individual 170 boards. You're correct. Mm -hmm. What I don't understand, though, and, and I've never understood about the states getting their money and how that will be rectified if, if you do go through the licensee model, um, is the state right now gets, gets taxes two ways on their on their product, they you get taxed on it when you buy it on the on the in on the shop in the in an ABC store. A restaurant gets taxed on that as well, actually more than the consumer, as we know. And then if you so, the restaurant buys it, they pay tax on it. Then um, then they sell it in a cocktail in the restaurant. The consumer then pays taxes on it. So the the state's getting taxed two times for that for that one bottle. How do, how do you supplement that? and get the state the money that they wouldn't wouldn't they be losing out on tax revenue at that point well um, if, if you went to the licensee model so the there are so many different charges and fees um that are currently part of the way that the state marks up okay um liquor some of those are state markups some of them are local markups i mean it really gets it's into not standard the weeds if you buy it in Durham County or, or sorry or Orange County or Wake County or Mecklenburg County, it, it can not... change a little okay. based on the well, and every local state tax. Charges mm -hmm. a tax on liquor. I mean, California start charges taxes on oh, liquor, yeah. but it goes to the the distributor or the supplier is paying those taxes. So somebody is always paying a tax on alcohol, no mm -hmm. matter what state you're in. We're just being as North Carolina very direct and upfront that it is for this specific bottle, and so restaurateur, you are paying tax directly on this bottle. But make no mistake, like the aforementioned Southern Wine and Spirits paid massive taxes because they're bringing in all this liquor. And so they're no, paying no, no, it to I, California. I, I get that. But, but yeah, oh, uh, yeah. So, I guess they're so, paying it to California. But yeah. It's so just what the would change. Get their is, money. Yeah, the state's going to get their money. Right now, the state is the wholesaler. Um, so the state collects the excise tax to give to itself. Right. Uh, right. If it were a private wholesaler, the private wholesaler would collect the excise tax and remit it to the state. To the, state. the state's still going to get, get their money. its yeah. money. Okay. So my question, though, is who's getting the licenses? Yeah. Who would who would qualify then? Would we start looking at, like, established beer and wine shops, like Triangle Wine Company, or just anything like Total Wine? Mm -hmm. Total Wine sells liquor all across the nation, except for in our state and other control states. But, of course, they would be the first ones with their hands up, like, uh, yeah, we need a liquor license or Costco or any of those. So who's getting those licenses if we become privatized or license license? Right. Um, and I think that's a policy question for, for lawmakers. Um, you know, personally, I think the best model is free market, um, wherein just like with beer and wine licenses, there's no limit mm -hmm. on those. Um, so if you were a total wine 
or you were a tasty beverage or whatever uh, food line, you know, you'd mm-hmm. have the option to apply for a permit. And as long as you met the requirements, you'd be able to sell that product too. Well, um, in, but in like, say like in Los Angeles, in, in Santa Monica, because I know this place well, there is a finite amount of liquor licenses. And I, that's what we were talking about. There would be a finite amount of liquor licenses available in the state as well if it went to the license here. I think model. that's still up for discussion. Okay. Because in Santa Monica, which is, is a good example, um, they have to wait till a business goes out of business or you can transfer, you know, somebody can buy a business out from another person, but they still have to transfer that license into their name. And there really can be no new ones. Oh, except for when big business comes in. Like if if a Costco opens in Santa Monica, miraculously, Costco was able to figure out how they got an extra license. Or, And I say it more specifically. I mentioned P.F. Chang's. Well, there was a P.F. Chang's that opened up on 4th and Wilshire, and we were already at the maximum of liquor licenses. And I know this because I was consulting with Sonny McLean's. That was a beer and wine bar that just got their liquor license, and they had to go through so many hoops. They spent $75,000 just to get the meeting for the city so they could get it through and pf chang's open with a full liquor license i'm like wait what the heck how do they get it oh well they have like a corporate uh national uh, oh you threw money at it that's what you did Mm -hmm. so that's what happened and that's you know the state wants to get their money so that's probably the way it's going to go here too i don't know i think that i don't think that's how we roll in north carolina um when you look at beer and wine permits i mean even in some states beer and wine licenses are finite and they become you know items of great value because people want to try to sell it when they sell their business yeah um i don't i don't know that our state would would go that route um but again that's a well, that's a you policy show them the money and then we'll figure out what, well, what yeah. that's yeah. a policy say. decision right um but we would advocate for a um a licensure system just like beer and wine yeah. Where it's there would be some heavy restriction on that because you couldn't just start having everybody open up and be like, yeah, I'm selling booze now. I'm selling booze. Yeah, yeah. but and also there as... are other ways to do that besides limiting license. You can do it overlay district for certain areas where you don't yeah. want that kind of where the city doesn't want that type of density in this area or sure. that. There are ways, other ways to skin that cat, as they say. Well, yeah. I was going to say that arguably when you bring a Costco or a business like that, other businesses will follow and thus eventually the population is going to rise. So you have to factor that in. There's a, 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 a finite amount of licenses, but it's relative to population, mm-hmm. I would assume. Yeah, it's like an electorate, electoral vote. Yeah. Yeah, so we will we will have 100 now, but when we triple in, in population, we'll have 300 or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to know, and you talked a little bit about this. You just need uh, like a like a champion, like a like a Chuck McGrady or Rick Gunn. But what what else are other factors as, as to why we are able to do this now? So I've been working on alcohol policy in the state of North Carolina since 2004. Okay. That's when I was executive director years. of the Wine and Grape Council. That's when I first started working on these things. And, you know, I think there's sort of been a um, a trailblazed. First it was wineries. Right. Then it was breweries who sort of showed the people of North Carolina that they're good neighbors and that they are they are businesses that have a positive impact on the local economy and jobs, and it gives um, our neighborhoods and our cities a local flavor. And that started to kind of change people's attitude about what alcohol was, Mm -hmm. that it could be part of this local food movement. And so once that started to shift attitudes, um, overall just this idea of um, updating our policies to to more reflect our current state, you know, we in are consumer habits when, when we have the most antiquated alcohol laws in the country, it does not reflect the way we do business in a lot of other ways in North Carolina. Yeah. So I think there's just this recognition that it's really time to t- take a hard look at the way we do it. Um, and there's been a bit of a, um, a changing um of the tide you know it's sort of started to flow the other way Mm -hmm. where people who are say this is business you know just take the word alcohol out of it um you know why would we hamper these businesses that are you know making our communities more robust Mm -hmm. economically they're bringing jobs um they're bringing tourism why would we why would we limit this 
And I, I think that that's, that's just been well, part of a sea of, change. Yeah. One side of the argument would be like, well, because you can't just remove the word alcohol from that conversation because it is a drug. And we're, we're basically saying we're allowing more freedom to sell more drugs openly in more areas. So I, I understand that side, too, and like why people are concerned about it, because you don't want... Uh, you know, Detroit in 1998, uh, kind of the same way. You know, you don't want what what L.A. was in 92, right? Like, you don't want, right. like, really, uh, really d- negative areas with rampant alcohol and drugs and all that. Just there needs to be some sort of sure. protection because this is a pretty amazing state in a lot of ways. And we want to keep it amazing but improve it as time goes yeah. through. But what I love what Margot said about that is once you take the – the distribution and wholesaling part away from the state, they have more time to focus on being regulators sure. and, and affect policy that way. So, you know, yeah. we might actually get something proactive. In yeah. That. And I mean, we, we respect the three tier system. We absolutely believe that, um, you know, the rule of law has got to continue. Regulations continue. Um, we're just treating spirits like beer and wine. Yeah. And that is, um, I think, sort of the direction we need to keep heading the other thing i love about all this is in all this talk and there's a lot of political uh talk and movements going on around this it's a bipartisan issue where republicans democrats independents have all come together on this and i don't remember the exact number but it was like a almost 70 percent of i think of the senate passed this yeah, it passed 31 to 10 in the Senate, 31 to 10. 91 to 21 in the House. It is absolutely a bipartisan issue, which for me makes it a real pleasure yeah. to work on. It's, I like it's a, working. It's a great model and example for the rest of our country, right? Right. Uh, mo- it's the one thing partisan, we can partisan, get partisan, together. Right? Yes. I mean, it is well, money and we all like booze, right? Whether yeah. you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can all get part. behind that. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. Yeah. Definitely. Well, Margo, before you get out of here and as our new uh, funky music is playing as we get out of here, it is really hot. We are going through a severe heat wave in North Carolina. So our amazing, beautiful cake from Bisto Baked Goods is being refrigerated right now. But we will hand it to you as you walk out the door so it doesn't melt all over the place because it is fantastic, delicious. Bisto Baked Goods, who we love, they are opening their new store very soon in Holly Springs. And uh, give them a shout out. Check out at Bisto Baked Goods on Instagram. Heather is a genius in the in the ba- in the in the kitchen, and so uh, go check them out before too long. Matt, what else yeah. you got? Thank you so much for this. Thank you for uh, pushing this policy forward. I think the more that we uh, can get towards leaner laws on liquor, we will all eat and drink very merrily. Regulated, but merrily. Regulated merrily. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. By rating us online, you're helping others to discover our show. The magic of SEO puts the salt on our rim. Follow us on all platforms at NCFBPod.